Hello and welcome to Business Standard. Here's a glimpse of the views expressed on the web pages of Business Standard this week. In his weekly column, National Interest, Shekhar Gupta writes that those who believed the Supreme Court judgment on the Ayodhya Babri Masjid dispute would also bring closure to other divisive temple mosque controversies in India was served a surprise by a district court in Varanasi. The court allowed a civil suit seeking an archaeological survey of India's study of the Gyanvyapi Mosque in Varanasi to determine if it had been superimposed after demolishing the Kashi Vishwanath Temple that might have originally stood there. Immediately, this looked like a sequel to the Ayodhya Babri Masjid story, this time lodged judicially. The Supreme Court ordered an Ayodhya had centers in the direction of the future. The Varanasi Court and celebratory responses to it are tempting us to make an about turn. The choice is ours, Gupta writes. In his weekly column for the Business Standard, T.N. Ayanand writes about the fizzling out of popular protests around the world and the assertion of state power. Pointing at the futility of protests, from the diminishing farmers' protests in India to those in Myanmar, Belarus, China, Hong Kong and Russia, Nainan writes about how even sustained street revolutions now fail in country after country and attributes the change in scenarios to shifting power balances. Citing the examples of Kyrgyzstan, Syria, Ukraine, among others, Nainan writes that it seems to be easier now to start revolutions than to influence their course. In his weekly column for the Business Standard, Mahesh Vyas writes that there are expectations that when mobility restrictions are removed, households will be in a strong position to spend as savings shot up during the pandemic. With vaccination underway, such a scenario is not too far, but the spike in household savings is in the richer households. The recovery in consumer spending in, the, in India is likely to be concentrated in the richer households if their sentiments are not that bad. Consumer sentiment data from the CMIE indicates that while all income groups are worse off than they were earlier, richer households are doing better than the rest on sentiment. The tipping point seems to be households that earn more than a million rupees a year. India's revival in consumer spending is therefore likely to be driven by households that earn more than a million rupees a year when the lockdown is lifted, writes Piaz. In a column for Business Standard, A.K. Bhattacharya writes that the improvements in tax administration will continue to yield benefits for the GST collection system in the coming months. But the resurgence of COVID-19 cases can be a spoiler. The key question is whether the union and state governments agree to undo the wrong moves taken in December 2018 to introduce rate cuts on a large number of items without any corresponding increase to protect the revenue neutral rate. If they can examine the question of rationalizing the rates to neutralize the ill effects of the decisions taken in December 2018, achieving sustainable growth in GST revenue in fiscal 2022 could be a possibility, provided the adverse effect of COVID-19 on economic activity can be contained, Bhattacharya writes. In a column for Business Standard, Prashanjit Datta writes that a law prohibiting all forms of private cryptocurrency, whether tethered or untethered to any underlying asset, would be similar to throwing out the baby with the bath water and also the bathtub itself. It comes from a failure to understand the technology and the underlying philosophy behind the cryptocurrencies. Prohibiting cryptos completely and trying to replace them with digital currencies issued by the central bank is not a solution either. The government needs to realize that cryptocurrencies today are what stocks were in the 17th century. They cannot be ignored and the door cannot be shut on them in the long run, Latta writes. Samya Kanti Ghosh writes in a column for Business Standard that the RBI policy statement is all about forward guidance, both implicit and explicit. First, the RBI shift from time-based guidance to state-based guidance is a commitment to support growth in an implicit manner in the current uncertain environment. Time-based is more explicit, state-based is more implicit. For example, growth on a durable basis is not quantifiable, but merely an implicit guidance on the state of the economy. Second the explicit guidance of a guaranteed liquidity support in the secondary market. The assured liquidity support is a clear resemblance to developed market central banks. So the RBI has nicely dovetailed a liquidity strategy to the Indian context, Ghosh writes. In a column for Business Standard, T.T. Ramohan writes, the Supreme Court's verdict in the Tata mystery case may baffle many who have watched the long drawn out battle between Ratan Tata and Cyrus Mistri. Common sense suggested that some of Mistri's complaint, especially the one about his summary removal as executive chairman, had substance. But common sense is no guide to the law. The Tatas stand vindicated in the matter. They will find most gratifying the Supreme Court's point that Tata Sons may be well ahead of the legal curve in respect of the functioning of its board. 
But what is legally sound does not always conform to the best standards of governance. Many will wish the Tata Group to stay ahead of the governance curve as well. One way to do so may be to subject Tata Sons to even higher standards of governance by making Tata Sons a public listed company, Mohan writes. Business Standard writes in an editorial that the RBI has done well to maintain the status quo by leaving the repo rate unchanged. But the policy path may not remain as straightforward in the coming quarters. The surge in COVID cases and international financial conditions can increase uncertainty. The RBI has to manage spillovers from the global economy. Faster than expected recovery in some of the advanced economies has raised inflation concerns. The IMF has noted that if monetary policy is used primarily to keep government borrowing costs low at the expense of ensuring price stability, inflation expectations and inflation could in principle increase rapidly. This is something that the RBI will need to be careful about. Supporting growth and government borrowing should not undermine the price and financial stability of objectives, the editorial says. In an editorial, Business Standard writes that a basic guiding principle of the IBC has been undermined with the introduction of a prepackaged resolution process for MSMEs. The point of the IBC has always been to not just ensure that capital is not destroyed, but that accountability returns to business. Distressed assets are to be auctioned and those who originally sent the company to the wall are not supposed to be able to buy them back. Introducing this fairness to the system is essential for the long-term health of Indian capitalism. Promoters should not be able to retain control of their companies. Once this principle is weakened, such dilution will Im- inevitably spread in time to the larger companies as well. If the efficiency of the IBC is what is holding up the resolution of MSMEs, the answer is to increase capacity and the number of resolution professionals, not undermine the principles of the IBC itself, the editorial says. In an editorial, Business Standard says India is setting new records in terms of fresh COVID-19 cases with daily cases rising from 20,000 to 100,000 in just 25 days, causing a partial lockdown and curfew in Maharashtra and other parts of the country. Yet, the businesses of religion and elections, two key super spreaders, have acquired a curious immunity from the enforcement of COVID-19 protocols. With the government-controlled vaccination drive yet to gather critical mass, the second wave is shaping up to infect the economic recovery. The argument that most recent cases are in Maharashtra which has neither the Mahakumb nor elections has some merit, but that doesn't justify this dangerous infection of public health by religion and politics, the editorial says. A long disagreement between India and Saudi Arabia over the price of crude oil has spilled out into the open in recent weeks, Business Standard writes in an editorial. The Indian government may naturally feel that it should leverage its status as a large and growing importer to get the best price possible. Even so, It is far from clear that the current diplomatic spat is the way to go. For reasons as distinct as managing Pakistan, counter-terrorism cooperation and foreign direct investment flows, Saudi Arabia is a very important partner for India. It's also the home of a large diaspora of Indian workers whose employment there provides India with much needed remittances. The broader India-Saudi Arabia relationship should not be allowed to suffer through undiplomatic wrangling over prices the editorial says. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views, and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram, and LinkedIn.